the Adena timeline, <clears throat> excuse me, in the academic record, you'll find 1000 BC to 300 BC. What I'm going to show you tonight, I'm looking at what's called, I'm taking a chunk out of the academic world called the archaic. I'm saying the, the late archaic and the Adena really make up one stretch. That's where my uh, research is taking me. So for me, my Adena world, my archaeology world for them really runs 3000 to 600 BC. And that's what I'm going to focus on. We'll see that just in a bit. Hopewell timeline, again, in the academic world, Ohio is the most numerous for finding artifacts. So the dates of 100 BC to 400 AD is what you will read and hear the most of. However, if you go to Illinois, the archaeologists will tell you it's 300 BC. You go to Tennessee, they'll tell you it's 600 BC. So it depends what state you're in. That's my point. But this is the general uh, timeline that you will see. But I'm saying we're looking at 600 BC to a 4 to 500 AD and timeline. And again, this is where I'm looking for my research, right in that area. These are the four prominent areas of the Hopewell. This is their concentrated areas where the artifacts are most dense in the situ. And the provenance that we look at here again is the Ohio area. This is when they start, 100 BC. Here's our Illinois, they call this Havana. That's at 300. Here's our, our Tennessee area, six to 500. And we also have a spot down here in the Gulf at 500 BC. These are the centers of concentration. This year we saw go by that great movie we saw today. This is the Hopewell Interaction Sphere. These are the various elements that come from all this wide range of trade. All this here, Rocky Mountains all the way to the East Coast, Canada all the way to the Gulf. All these things are found in the burials of the Hopewell. Okay. It's hard to say. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Hopefully you. Come right ahead. Come right ahead. Uh, it came from uh, these other pieces. <laughs> But it's there, yeah. You, know, you see, follow the data. That's what the data. Right. Uh, what, what would you interpret that as? Uh, it looks like a Pegasaurus to me. Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, man. It's, it has an analog in Angkor Wat. Yeah. Now, of course, now in uh, in Illinois, we have this shark, and we have a whale, all from Illinois. And and these. These are Michigan pieces. These three here. That's the Michigan tablet story which is uh, big unto itself. Copper, slate, and clay. Okay, well, where was that found? Where well, these were found 1840 to 1920, all okay. lower Michigan. And upper Indiana. Upper Indiana. I should say a couple in Wisconsin while you're at it. But uh, nice little bears here. Got a nice ram. Are these all uh, from mounds? Uh, yeah, burial mounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have no idea what these are for. Anybody got an idea? Let me know. Yes. Let's see, we'll see, see it tomorrow. Oh, see it tomorrow. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> they like snooker, snooker balls. No, it was a little more sophisticated than a sling. Good. I'm in, I'm in the, uh, the ball game. Yeah. Chunky? No, Chunky was a, a, a more of a cylindrical thing. Oh, uh, well, this is interesting. This is a very crude, I hate to say the word lamp, but that's what it was for. You put your bear grease in here. You lay a wick across that notch and your flame would stand right here. Right. Now notice what John just showed you. Here's that unusual symbol. Right. It's on the lamp. It's right there. The square over the uh, upside down, like a table shape. And then right over here we have the mystic symbol. All right. right there. Can you guys see it? Yeah, I can. Go okay. Yeah, yeah. It's mystic symbols right there. This is from Illinois. This is not from Michigan. These are typical Hopewell items that are accepted by academia. This is a three-quarter axe. This is the platform pipe, excuse me, the effigy pipe. We find copper tooling and we find beautiful pottery. Again, these also represent typical Hopewell artifacts found in the archaeological record. And this right here is particularly interesting because we do find the copper breastplates. I want to say something very, it's really neat. These copper breastplates, as they're buried with the individual, the, carbon, uh, the, the copper carbonate from the plate itself preserves whatever is underneath that plate. In this case, it's going to be the clothing that the person was wearing upon interment. If you go to Columbus and go to the museum there, you will find they have a large cabinet with really thin drawers. And you pull out one drawer at a time, very close together. They're all lined with fabric that the Hopo people were wearing upon being buried. And it's not buckskin. It's woven fabric. 
and multiple colors. Yet you won't find one example anywhere in any museum showing Hopewell people dressed in these multicolored fabrics. Uh, I don't get it. And if you want to see the best ones, you got to go to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. They have the biggest collection of cloth. And I tell you, it's absolutely something to see. It will, you'll just be surprised. It is absolutely gorgeous. Now, next thing I want to point out here, which is really fun, is this guy up here is at Mound City. And when you go into the museum there, he's identified as a bird of prey or a hawk or an eagle. What's wrong with this picture? Why? Isn't that simple? This is a parrot. So then the first question becomes, well, it's too cold up here for parrots. Well, it is today, but it wasn't then. And we have our Viking and Norwegian enthusiasts to thank for that because they have developed and pursued what's called the Little Ice Age. We now know between 12 and 1300 AD, there was a whole cold line shift and everything dropped down. And that's when all the castles in England stopped being built. They could no longer heat them. And at that time, England was known for the best wine in Europe. When the cold line shift took place, all the vineyards moved to south of France and the north of Italy. Coal line shift. Simple. Okay? This definitely is paired. Now, this happened, I was at Mound City just about, about a week ago. I had 55 people on a bus tour, we're just finishing up. The curator came out and he held up this image and he says to my group, he says, can anybody tell me what kind of bird this is? And everybody just kind of looking around because they just came out of the class, you know, the, the museum, and they're saying, "Well, falcon, you know, eat whatever." They're repeating the words that they saw on the on the thing, and then they all pointed at me. Well, we think our, our tour guide knows. So the museum curator he looks over at me and says, "Do you know what this bird is?" I said, "Yeah, I do. It's a North American parakeet." He says, "You're absolutely correct." <laughs> and then he gave this is my reward. I got a big parakeet sticker. You probably can't see it, but that was my prize. So I asked him, I said, well, if that's the case, why, why don't you go in there and change that? Take that hawk and eagle name off this parrot. He says, well, I'm not in charge. I'm number two guy. Yeah. So there you have it. Okay, just fun stuff that goes on, all right? Uh, copper head plates. We know that these people and, uh, wore these. They're held on by grommets. These are ear and chin guards. And when you get into the old books and you read them as they're uncovered, they're held on with some type of cloth. So they had a cloth cap where these things were attached, and that was worn as a headgear. And the biggest collection of these is in the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. And they don't have them on display, you have to ask for them. This lovely collection of pipes was gathered by Squire and Davis as they went through the mounds in the 1830s and 1840s throughout the Mississippi Valley and the Ohio area. And these, unfortunately, all reside in London. <laughs> Their entire collection, about 3,000 pieces, all went across the seas. So if you want to see it, you've got to take a boat ride or an airplane ride. <coughs> Again, pottery, very, very nice for the Hopewell. This is mica, uh, items for decoration, they're just gorgeous stuff, all accepted. And surprise, guess what? We have concrete with the Hopewell. Now here's another, another funny thing. If you go into a museum run by the state of Ohio, OHS, they will never talk about this. You go into a, a park run by the federal government, they will show and talk about Hopewell concrete. The guys at Mound City tell us that every mound there had a cap of concrete over the top of it. And if you read carefully in your books, you'll find that when they broke into these to excavate, they took a pickaxe to break this crust to get through. And not only that, some of the places they got to the bottom, they found the charnel houses, which were preparation for the burial. Some of those floors were also spread out with a concrete floor. These guys knew how to make concrete. I just got this a year ago. This for me is pretty new stuff. What's that, ladies? Pearls. Pearls. Let's check out these Hopewell. One group of Hopewell people in Hamilton County, Ohio, collected and disposed of 48,000 pearls in an artifact deposit that was later covered by the Turner Mound. Archaeologists excavated the Hopewell site in the 1880s found over 100,000 pearls. Some were inset into bare canine tooth buttons or applied to copper ornaments. Most had been drilled, perhaps with a hot copper wire, strung as a necklace or sewn onto clothing. Pearls. These people like to dress up. You'll never see it in the painting. Now, 
Here's all the artifacts that are found with the Hopewell, but they don't tell you about them. You have to find someone like me or like you that know about this stuff. And what are they called? Ooh parts, out of place artifacts. <laughs> stuff that's not supposed to be here, but it is. Data. Let's follow the data. Take a look at the ooh parts. This right here is definitely a smoking gun. William Connor found this at Chillicothe, digging out one of the smelters. And right here we have a clay mold. This is an iron axe head sticking out of the mold. And what's interesting is here's the plug where it had to be poured in, which means they had some kind of a mobile crucible to do that. This is high tech stuff for their time. And this is the other side. There's your axe head. All iron. And this is clay. What's the clay? Can you date the clay? Uh, yeah, thermal luminescence. Want to pay for it? I'll gladly give you a chunk because I own this. <laughs> when you go to the furnace sites, we have this green slag that's only, you only find it in furnace sites. It's not created by Mother Nature. So you find this green slag all over the rocks. This is from the smelting process. So we know that these were furnaces. Uh, Bill Connor has got over 110 of them identified just in Ohio. Just in Ohio. 110 furnace. We got no smelting in Hopewell. Okay. <laughs> This right here is a collection off the Missouri River, right up into North Dakota. Just take a look at that stuff. Look at this. I have one of these in the back of my table. I've got one of these back on my table. And Scott, are you here? Scott here? This, this piece right here identifies that one that was cast in the back because of the square butt end right here. It's, it's, it's practically identical. Who parts? This is also Scott's. This one's been cleaned off. This has definitely been cast. This is not hammered or annealed as we talked about the early copper. This one here was, all these were found this summer, by the way. Uh, this one here was found in the river in northern Wisconsin. A little different style. This one also has been cast. All new stuff. And this is uh, Scott's cast ones, all found this summer. And this one right here is bronze. Right here, and that's back on my table. Come on back and see it. This is uh, my nice copper sword. How's that? <laughs> So I would, uh, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, look at that. I still got the pin. What? Pin. Yeah. You don't see pins around. I mean, there's parts of the language on here. It's been around since like two or three thousand BC. Some of it goes up to 100 AD. So I mean, we just, we just don't know. We don't have any carbon stuff to check. However, clay tablets. We could use thermal luminescence on these. Okay. And uh, hopefully be some success in getting a date if they're not contaminated by being on the air, which I don't know. Can you tell me which mound that came from? Well, we don't know a mound, it's just out of the state of Michigan. Okay, okay. 27 counties. And this one here? Any Same. Other? 27 counties. Because they just get excavated, they don't get They're pulled up by farmers breaking the land first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is it, is it double-sided? Uh, this one is. This, this one here. This one? Yeah. I'm going to roll this one over for you. It's in two pieces. I glued it together because... There's the other side. Where is where is this file? That's Michigan. Michigan tablet. It's a Michigan tablet, yeah. And this one's only on one side. Only on one side. So what happened to all the Michigan plates? Are they still stuck? Well, they're scattered in small collections all over, but a lot of them have been destroyed. But what what about the stuff that came right back from Salt Lake City? Well, it's in Michigan. They gave it to the state of Michigan. Did they like, got them out on display? Or? Yeah, they, they stocked them. They're put away. You can't see them anymore. And they're they're boxed. Boxed. Yeah, they're boxed. They're boxed. Dr. Halsey made sure of that. And then we find, of course, this big anomaly, probably the most troubling, is the Hebrisms, as I call it, of North America. This here is the Ten Commandments stone. This right here is the keystone. Both have complete readable Hebrew. Both came out of Hopewell burials, Hopewell timeline, out of Ohio. This one right here was, Weirich was the first guy that found this one here. It's a Hebrew on all four sides. It's like the word of the Lord, Lord is God, Lord is King, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Totally readable in Hebrew. Here, this one is the Ten Commandments, all the way around the front, the sides, and the back. Up here it says Moshe for this man standing here. And again, this is just a little clip taken from our early antiquarians. The builders of these mounds south of the Great Lakes in the great Mississippi Valley in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, New York, etc., must have understood the Hebrew characters and also understood the law of Moses. And of course, we know about how famous this has become. 
Uh, we got Scott Walter, who now has studied this thing uh, under the microscope. He's uh, pretty much proved the geology of this thing is definitely old. And this is the uh, uh, Bat Creek Stone. The Cherokee actually owned this stone. They're trying to get it back from the Smithsonian. Smithsonian told them they would give it back to them. And so they went to get it this, uh, this past summer in July. They filed the proper papers. Uh, Smithsonian refused to give it back. So right now, the Cherokee of North Carolina and the Smithsonian, they're duking it out to get this returned to the museum in North Carolina. Because the Cherokee, they're going to put this on display with the correct translation that this is a Paleo-Hebrew script. Because when this was on display in the Smithsonian, it was upside down and they said it was some form of Cherokee. But it was displayed upside down. And of course, this guy here, uh, Dr. Gordon was the first guy to see this or recognize it. Henriette Mertz kind of put him on to it. She felt it was the same thing. So they both realized this was definitely a very, very old piece. I got this great photo from Dr. John White. This belongs to the Potawatomies of the state of Michigan. This is something that they own. It's theirs from their ancient past. When you ask them what it is, they say this is a symbol of our ancient ancestors. Archaeologists have wrote this off as a fancy pitchfork. <laughs> okay, I'm telling you, this is this is this is legit, guys. This is what it is. These are ooh parts. They can't be here. These are ooh parts. Keep that in mind. This right here is the best news I've had in several years. And Jim uh, shares, are you here? James, are you in here? Back there. Uh, this comes from uh, James L. Guthrie. So Jim came to my house back in 1989. He put me on the quest to go find these things, and I found, put a lot of time into it. I uh, haven't had a lot of support in academia, but finally, Guthrie, he says, I was both shocked and pleased to read an article, this is by Dr. White, by the way, by a respected scientist, epigrapher, and diffusionist who restated his view of certain suspect artifacts and sites that suggest there is possible value in these finds long before they are scrutinized with greater efforts. Guthrie's article discusses seven old finds with ancient epigraphy. He makes some interesting points about the relics of southeast Michigan having the mystic symbol in common. The traditional fraud makers are Scottford and Daniel Sober. Some 10 to 20 percent of the artifacts may be frauds, but many of those could have been copies of broken clay tablets. The important observation is that the content of the alleged frauds, and this is the important part, is often intriguing because of subtleties present that are an alleged that an alleged fraud maker could not have known about that's at the time these first surfaced in the 1840s remember in the early 1840s is when campoleon first broke the code at the sphinx and yet we find egyptian hieroglyphics all over these tablets but there also are other markings as well and then he goes on to say um, <clears throat> Such an artifact may be uh, legitimate or a simple copy. Another 80% may be totally legitimate. This is my expectation of most ancient sites. So the point is, this begins to open the door for possibly getting people who are recognized in academia to restudy this work. Now, would you not agree this is pretty neat stuff? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Halsey, who you saw his face today on here, right? Mr. Halsey? Okay. John will tell you, this is Egypt, this is Michigan folk art made by the pioneers of Michigan. <laughs> the Michigan people, they cleared the land of trees and stumps. They sat around at night and they pulled up this black slate, which is all over Michigan, and they all went to work and did this. And it all happens to match. The guy who lives, by the way, this comes out of 27 counties throughout Michigan. Okay. And we've got at least 10,000 pieces, some estimates high as 30,000 pieces. 1846 to 1920. That's when all this came out of the ground, but we can't say that. I'm not talking about the artifacts. Man. Now, we've got some other more ooh parts. This is brand new, uh, just, just popped up a couple years ago. Guys digging a basement, uh, was witness, this came out of the ground. I don't know what, what it is, some, I just call it a funerary urn. Um, this, is just, this is very readable, it's just straight text off the Book of the Dead. No magic spells, nothing special, okay? Uh, we, we got this too. What's it made of? I can't tell you, we haven't had it examined yet. Okay. Uh, every time we get some examined, it costs a lot of cash, so I have to realize that. Uh, this is Yashopki. This was found in the uh, 1950s in northern Illinois on the Plains River. And uh, this, everything here is absolutely correct Egyptian. We did an article on this in Ancient American compared to one found in Mexico and to one from Egypt, and side by side, and it's a great, great article. Great piece, great, great piece. 
And this right here is uh, the sky god, uh, Egyptian Anut. And uh, this was found out of West Virginia. And I got this out of the Jack Ward collection out of uh, in the Indiana. Uh, again, this was on the Mahongalit River and was found in 1979. And Jack purchased it from a private collector. So we got Egyptian stuff. This is a, a beautiful, this is an Adina lamp, <coughs> oil lamp. This is a, I got it standing up for picture's sake. It sits on its, on its backside. This is where you pour the oil in. Uh, the flame would come off the tip here by the feet. And uh, this comes out of a Dina mound. It was marked to be excavated and preserved, but something happened. The uh, uh, West Virginia Department of Transportation mowed the mound down. And this guy, uh, what was his name, David, David Williams, he would go out there at night and sift through the dirt. And he, he managed to find uh, this thing it's intact, not busted up. And uh, I now have it in my collection. It's absolutely beautiful. I had it here last year. Some of you probably saw it. It's a beautiful piece. And, of course, we do have blonde-haired mummies coming out of Tennessee. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that before. They're in the Peabody Museum. We also now know that hair color does not change over time. If you're very brown hair, your hair's going to be brown for a long time. Blondes. And of course we mentioned cuneiform. This is at Quaker City, Ohio. This tablet was found and it was validated by Professor, where is he at? David Owen at uh, Cornell. And he said this is a 2000 BC tablet from Ur. And of course, and it was already mentioned what, what the cast off is on this. When something like this pops up, the first thing you say, well, the guy, somebody went over on a trip and they bought a bunch of little tablets. And they're only one inch square, they're real tiny. And he just, was out hunting some day and he had the tablets in his pocket. And while he was hunting, by gosh, he had a hole in his pocket. And this slipped out into the forest. And it was found who knows how many years later. And voila. Okay? These are the answers we get back from all of our ooh parts. Now, this is this here we have to go over because this I reprinted this book. Now this is this is what they say, and this is this is all legit. This is what's taught to our kids in, in archaeology. Much more evidence of light tenor, what you just saw, might be presented here as, for example, the numerous instances in which articles of European manufacture have been found. Now just stop. They're recognizing the artifacts are real, but they're made across the sea. However, however, <clears throat> have been found in mounds where their presence, now listen to this, could not be attributed to an intrusive burial. So make sure you understand what that means. Someone builds a mound, let's say 1000 BC, they bury a couple guys dead center. Let's say a thousand years goes by, it's now 1 AD, somebody new moves into town, and the loved one dies, and they then just dig a hole on the side of that big soft dirt pile, and they bury their loved one right there on the side. That's an intrusive burial. So he's saying these artifacts are not on the surface. They're not intrusive. What he's saying is they're found deep inside the mounds. And that's the problem. Because they are made in, by Europeans, but they shouldn't be here. Okay? And this is by, and of course he ends up by saying, who were the authors of the typical works of Ohio? And this is Cyrus Thomas. This is uh, Powell's right-hand man uh, running around tearing up the, the mounds. And I just, uh, boy, I tell you, it just pops in my cork when I read this. But his whole work, I've got it published, it's back on the table. You didn't bring that big one that Lee brought up to you, back up to you, is that it? Yeah. These are out of uh, Red Cedar River in Dunn County, Wisconsin. And you find these very common in uh, Central and South America, but here we've got them in North America. Yeah, in Peru, the women are constantly spinning the That's tourist it. traps. That's and, them. Uh, and I've never bothered to learn what they're doing. Yep. Thank you. You found any gold pieces? Uh, I haven't, but the Hopewell Mounds have gold in them. Okay. okay. Oh, they do. Look at this ugly guy. Is he ugly or what? Look at him. That is weird. Yeah, he's ugly self portrait. Let, let, this reminds me of what they talk about, like a wood spirit, you know, like budge in the woods or some you know, horsing around. <laughs> he's just ugly. <laughs> <laughs> he's ugly. <laughs> Guru, Mount, this is his uh, Mounds for the Dead book. He talks about these people, the Adina now, being large. 
He says, two outstanding traits have been repeatedly noted repeatedly for this group. One is the protruding massive chin and the prominent bilateral protrusion. The second trait is the large size of males and females. Male of six feet was common. Some Indian protein seven have been found. For example, the Dover and the Cresap Mound. Uh, also, the women were more than six feet in height. Not only were the Dina people tall, but also the massiveness of the bones indicate powerfully built individuals. That's the book, Mounds for the Dead. It's all legitimate. This is a Adina skull. This is a Hopewell skull. And here's a Adina jawbone. This right here, this dental mold would fit most of the men in this room. So these guys are broader, bigger than we are. And you can find a lot of this in Fritz Zimmerman's work on the Adina. Let's just keep going here. This was in my last magazine, for those of you who subscribe. This guy was actually purchased by the Smithsonian. You know, you'd think they'd have him on display. I'd drive there just to see this guy, you know, and pay the five bucks to get in or whatever it is. But he's not even on display. And if you ask him where he is, I don't even know if they can tell you. How tall are they? What are uh, they call he's him? close to nine. Oh. Mm -hmm. What do they call him? Oh, I don't know. Does he have a name? No. Uh, I don't think so. No. $500 man, I guess. A big tall guy. Big tall guy. Now, interesting, in our day, in Pennsylvania, there was a group of Indians running seven foot tall, historically. They're called the Susquehannocks. You go to uh, Waverly, New York, or Athens, Pennsylvania, they have a huge hill fort, looks just like a Hopewell enclosure, high up on top, earth and pavements all around, and it's right there, it actually straddles both sides of Pennsylvania and New York, it's right on the line. Got a great museum there, talks about this, these guys. This is the average size of the Europeans. We found these guys five and a half foot. Susquehanna's run at seven feet tall. And of course, what happened to them? Not warfare, our disease got to them. We killed them all through disease. Of course, big guys mean big tools. All right? <laughs> big, oh, hammer, I'm sorry. Now, get your mind out of the gutter. I'll go check this out. Uh, I've been trying to track this guy down because I want to get the weight on this axe. This thing is huge. Just huge. Big blank. Again, this is all in Pennsylvania. This is mine. This is 17 and a half pounds. This is hafted, so imagine swinging that with a handle. Uh, this here is an 11 inch kelp. Most kelps run 5 to 7, sometimes 8, but 11 is just unheard of, except for the big guys. Well, see, it, see it tomorrow. Oh, see it tomorrow. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> like snooker, snooker balls. No, it was a little more sophisticated than a sling. Good. I'm in, I'm in the, uh, the ball game. Yeah. Chunky? No, Chunky was a, a, a more of a cylindrical thing. Oh, well, this is interesting. This is a very crude, I hate to say the word lamp, but that's what it was for. You put your bear grease in here you lay a wick across that notch and your flame would stand right here. Right. Now notice what John just showed you. Here's that unusual symbol. Right. It's on the lamp. It's right there. Square over the uh, upside down, like a table shape. And then right over here we have the mystic symbol. All right. right there. Can you guys see it? Yeah, I can. Go okay. Yeah, yeah. It's mystic symbol is right there. This is from Illinois. This is not from Michigan. These are typical Hopewell items that are accepted by academia. This is a three-quarter axe. This is the platform pipe, excuse me, the effigy pipe. We find copper tooling and we find beautiful pottery. Again, these all sort of... Yeah. Do you mind? <laughs> Hopefully you. Come right ahead, boy. Come right ahead. Uh, it came from uh, these other pieces. <laughs> but it's there. You, know, you see, follow the data. That's what the data... Right. Uh, what, what would you interpret that as? Uh, it looks like a uh, Pegasaurus to me. Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, man. That's... It has an analog in Angkor Wat. Yeah. Right? Now, of course, now in uh, in Illinois, we have this shark, and we have a whale, all from Illinois. And and these these are Michigan pieces. These three here. That's the Michigan tablet story, which is uh, big unto itself. Copper, slate, and clay. Okay, well, where was that found? Where well, these were found 1840 to 1920, all okay. lower Michigan. And upper Indiana. Upper Indiana. I should say a couple in Wisconsin while you're at it. But uh, nice little bears here. Got a nice ram. 
Are these all uh, from mounds? Uh, yeah, burial mounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have no idea what these are for. Anybody got an idea? Let me know. Yes. The Adena timeline, <clears throat> excuse me, in the academic record, you'll find 1000 BC to 300 BC. What I'm going to show you tonight, I'm looking at what's called, I'm taking a chunk out of the academic world called the archaic. I'm saying the, the late archaic and the Adena really make up one stretch. That's where my uh, research is taking me. So for me, my Adena world, my archaeology world for them really runs 3000 to 600 BC. And that's what I'm going to focus on. We'll see that just in a bit. Hopewell timeline, again, in the academic world, Ohio is the most numerous for finding artifacts. So the dates of 100 BC to 400 AD is what you will read and hear the most of. However, if you go to Illinois, the archaeologists will tell you it represent typical Hopewell artifacts found in the archaeological record. And this right here is particularly interesting because we do find the copper breastplates. I want to say something very, it's really neat. These copper breastplates, as they're buried with the individual, the, carbon, uh, the, the copper carbonate from the plate itself preserves whatever is underneath that plate. In this case, it's going to be the clothing that the person was wearing upon interment. If you go to Columbus and go to the museum there, you will find they have a large cabinet with really thin drawers. And you pull out one drawer at a time, very close together. They're all lined with fabric that the Hopo people were wearing upon being buried. And it's not buckskin, it's woven fabric and multiple colors. Yet you won't find one example anywhere in any museum showing Hopewell people dressed in these multicolored fabrics. <laughs> I don't get it. And if you want to see the best ones, you got to go to the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. They have the biggest collection of cloth. And I tell you, it's absolutely something to see. It will, you'll just be surprised. It's 300 BC. You go to Tennessee, they'll tell you it's 600 BC. So it depends what state you're in. That's my point. But this is the general uh, timeline that you will see. But I'm saying we're looking at 600 BC to a 4 to 580 and timeline. And again, this is where I'm looking for my research, right in that area. These are the four prominent areas of the Hopewell. This is their concentrated areas where the artifacts are most dense in the situ. And the provenance that we look at here again is the Ohio area. This is when they start, 8, 100 BC. Here's our Illinois, they call this Havana, that's at 300. Here's our, our Tennessee area, 6 to 500, and we also have a spot down here in the Gulf at 500 BC. These are the centers of concentration. This year we saw go by that great movie we saw today. This is the Hopewell Interaction Sphere. These are the various elements that come from all this wide range of trade. All this here, Rocky Mountains all the way to the East Coast, Canada all the way to the Gulf. All these things are found in the burials of the Hopewell. Okay.